That was my brief. That's why I went <laughs> So thank you for inviting me today. So in interest of me leaving alive, I'm not going to make any comparisons with radiotherapy or surgery. But just to give you a flavor of what's happening in radiotherapy. It's quite a lot happening, so it's going to be quite a general talk, just going through some principles and some of the technologies being implemented both in the UK and the rest of the world. So disclosure slide, we're moving on. So what I want to do today is talk about some new ray therapy technology, something called 4D adaptive ray therapy. We're now moving on from a standard linear accelerator to an MRI-based linear accelerator. Protons are not new in the world, but they're new to the UK. And then briefly go some through new ray therapy research, including SABRE, some, some local advanced disease, and the role of ray therapy, which is evolving more in metastatic disease. So, what is 4D adaptive ray therapy? So in the UK, we had a ray therapy who was way behind in the late 2000s. And the National Ray Therapy Advisory Group set out the important role of 4D adaptive ray therapy. And that should become the standard of care for all our patients. There's some caveats with that, unfortunately. They didn't really define what it was. And at that stage, technology wasn't there to be able to deliver this. So now technology's <coughs> moved on. So for lung cancers, we now plan our patients with 4D CT. This is now standard of care. So we can now assess where the tumor is, how much it's moving, and then accompany that into the planning algorithm. We can also then adapt that if it's moving a lot, gate the ray therapy, allow for that in our planning. We get a nice plan based on that. We can then actually visualize it. So what we used to do is rely on the patient being in the same position every day and rely that the tumor would be in the same position every day. But clearly that was very unreliable. So what we do now is we routinely form 3D image guidance where we can match where the tumor is, we can see where critical organs are, and then make a very accurate shift on the bed. So again, this is now standard of care that wasn't 10 years ago. So we're now much more accurate in what the ray therapy we deliver. But this isn't 4D ray therapy, this is 3D ray therapy. It's making sure the geometrical de definitions are right. But as time moves on, we can now look at 4D. So this is a patient who has a small tumor in the right lower lobe, We've allowed for their tumor motion in our planning algorithm, but we want to check that their tumor is still within that. So we can form what's called a 4D cone beam. And you can see that our tumor nicely conforms to the shape we've allowed for. So we can be very confident with delivering that dose. The next step is can we actually track tumors? So there's now a number of commercial systems on the market that can track tumors, either based on an external surrogate or an implanted fiducial. Both these systems you've probably heard of, particularly the cyber knife, which has been heavily marketed, where it can either track uh, sort of position on the bo patient's body or with implanted fiducials using X-ray. And that can be a very nice technique, particularly for those tumors that move a lot. There are some problems, obviously, with lung cancer patients putting fiducials in. There is a risk of pneumothorax, so it has to be carefully used. And it's not a technology for all, but it's getting increasingly available. So we're now moving to the stage where we can deliver 40 adaptive ray therapy. So, where are we at the moment? So we have technologies improved, but I think when we come to adaptive ray therapy, there's three classifications. So what we can do is saying reactive. So we see a patient on the bed, we perform an image, and that image shows there's been a big change. So we have to react to that change and then replan that patient. And sometimes that can take a day or two, so that patient will either carry on with that treatment plan, which may be suboptimal, or we have to stop the treatment and then change. So reactive is probably the best way of doing adaptive ray therapy, but it's what's currently standard done in most centers. We could be proactive. So we can say, well, actually, we know week three of every six-week treatment, that tumor will change. So we can plan for that, allow that. And that's been done routine in head and neck ray therapy, but there isn't much in terms of lung ray therapy. And this is the holy grail. Can we do real-time adaptive ray therapy? So we get the patient on a bed, we perform an image, we register that image so they're in the right place, but we also adapt the plan to based on that image. So we calculate the plan. That calculation is performed, we deliver the dose. So we also know exactly what dose we're delivering. We can adapt to changes, and we get a real dose. So at the moment, we're doing this. Some places are doing this. But again, even with the current level of technology, this is not routine standard of care. It requires a lot of computer power. However, that will change in the next five years. One of the ways that's going to have to change is using the MR Linux. So we now have two MR Linux. One is a view ray system, which is commercially available. This is initially a cobalt-based system, but we now have an MRI-based system. 
the number of these in the, in the world, and the elector system that's not commercially available yet, but should have an FDA approval this year. So why would you want to combine an MRI with a LUNAC? It's very technically demanding. A, a magnet is not very good with radiation beams. It can bend those beams. It can affect those beams. So what is the potential advantages of that? So it's not straightforward. Very complex physics problems. As I said, there's two versions available, but not routine use in the UK, but had lots of advantages. So we know MRI is better soft tissue matching, better resolution. We can get better 3D and 4D imaging during the radiotherapy. So we can actually acquire Im images as they're going through the treatment to make sure that they're still in the same place or gate it. But, and this is, I suppose, the next step, we can actually do functional imaging. So we can do functional imaging before. You might then see areas of hypoxia. The tumor's hypoxia, it's more radio resistant, so you could target the dose there. Or you can see what's happening during the radiotherapy and afterwards and adapt your plan. So we're now getting to the stage, hopefully, as these systems evolve, that we'll be able to get retime adaptive planning. And both of these packages have had a lot of software work to develop the software around to develop that and deliver that. Protons. So protons have been around for a long time, but like in the UK, we don't adapt new technology quickly, particularly in radiotherapy. So this was announced in 2007, along 2012. There'll be centers, proton centers in Manchester and London. The one in the Christie, the Christie's slightly more advanced, and hope that'll be treating patients this year. The one at UCL is not quite as advanced. So by the end of this year, we'll have a proton facility in the UK. So why are protons so expensive? Each center costs about 150 million pounds, but also why are they potentially advantageous? So this is my only slide about physics. So what it's trying to show here is our standard beam is a photon beam. So as that beam hits the patient, the maximum dose depends on the energy. So it's usually around one and a half to two centimeters underneath the skin. So quite a long way away from where the tumor is. And that dose has to fall as you go towards it. So obviously, we have to lose lots of beams. So each beam contributes a bit, so you get a higher dose here and relative sparing of the tissues. But protons have a new property, from the Brad Peak. They're a heavy particles. So they go through the body quicker. When they get to a certain level, they dispense their energy very quickly, and they have something called the Brad Peak, where the energy falls off very rapidly afterwards. So you can get a very steep dose gradient between tumor and normal tissue. And that's very advantageous for things like spinal tumors, brain tumors, but also for kids, where obviously the consequence of any sprayed radiation dose is much more. So could protons be helpful in lung? Difficult. Go back to this. Why might it be difficult in lung? Well, it's also very sensitive to motion. So that tumor's moving, and you estimate their path length based on where the tumor is at one stage of respiration. If it moves, that proton could travel further and deliver its dose where it doesn't want to deliver it. So we have to be very careful in the lung where the protons may be acceptable and how beneficial they will be. They may be useful in anterior mediastinal tumors. They may be useful for retreatment. But I think the jury's still out in terms of standard patients where the protons are beneficial in lung cancer. This leads us to a problem. How do we evaluate these new technologies? So you can either adopt the model where you're an early adopter, you prove this technology is deliverable, you don't compare it against a standard of care, but you broaden indications, and eventually it becomes a standard of care for all patients. The traditional UK model is if you're a late adopter, you're restricted for certain indications only, such as pediatric patients, and then it becomes a standard of these care indications, and then you try and broaden it later. There's lots of pros and cons of both models, but I think in America, where protons were adopted very early, some of those centers are now closing because there isn't the, the business case in the model to run them. So in the UK, we're trying to evaluate these new technologies. And CAUK, as part of the ArtNet project, has funded five centers to come together to try and evaluate these. These are Leeds, the Christie, Oxford, UCH, and the Royal Marsden. And what we're trying to do in this is trying to say, we've got these new tools, they look fantastic, but actually how can we prove their value? So that's from four or five work streams. So the work streams, one is to base, can we do MRI-based planning? How can we do fast and adaptive replanning? Motion management, look at function imaging. Protons, although they've got very good dose properties, the actual verification systems were poor, so how can you bring them up to the standard of a normal LINAC? But I think critically is how can they fit into a health economic model? How can they be deliverable in a public health system? 
and how can we design trials that are ethical to try and prove their value? So where we are in terms of other research. So we've talked about technology, let's talk about some research. So I'm going to focus on, not on stereotactic radiotherapy versus surgery, but stereotactic radiotherapy <coughs> versus conformal radiotherapy. There's a lot of debate in the radiotherapy community that we've done lots of prospective studies. We've not compared it against our standard of care. This is a study done by David Bull from Australia, which compared stereotactic radiotherapy to a more conventional fractionated regime. And it showed a much improvement with stereotactic radiotherapy, local failure rates, and boom period in survival. So whilst it's quite a small study, potentially underpowered, it did show a potential benefit. And that goes along with other studies that show that stereotactic radiotherapy is better tolerated, has better local control. So we now believe for those patients who are medically inoperable, whose tumors are peripheral, that stereotactic radiotherapy is a standard of care. I think this is a really interesting study. And I think a lot of radiation colleges have poo-pooed this a little bit because the details of the radiotherapy were scanty. There's questions about the quality of the radiotherapy because the placebo arm, which was just conventional chemo radiotherapy on its own, did bad, badly. But I look at it another way. Regardless of the quality of the radiotherapy, the addition of Duvalimab, a checkpoint inhibitor, a pd one inhibitor, made a massive difference in disease-free survival, or progression-free survival. So it's showing that about half the patients had no evidence of disease progression at 18 months. And if you compare that with our average survival of these patients, that's better than our average survival so far. So it's suggesting that adding in a checkpoint inhibitor after chemo radiotherapy will improve survival, and we wait for the survival data to come. But again, very tempting. And it also lays into the fact we believe that radiotherapy may enhance these checkpoint inhibitors by releasing tumor antigens and get a better response. We're now moving into territory we haven't moved into before. So is there a rationale for stereotactic radiotherapy to other metastatic disease? So I know this, people are very familiar with this. So Helen and Weichenbaum, a close of the in all state in 1995. And I suppose the idea is, if we can eradicate those metastasis, either it being taken out surgically, ablate them with radio frequency ablation microwave, or static radiotherapy, could we possibly improve their progression-free survival, their overall survival, and could we cure some of those patients? We know that we're using much more imaging, so we are detecting patients with small numbers of extra metastasis. So the believers in SAVE would say, well, we've got technology to treat this. It's an outpatient-based treatment, Low rates of toxicity, high rates of load control, let's just do it. Yep, this all treatment was safer. Well, again, there's lots of debate about that, and how do you assess these, these technologies? So in the UK, we currently have a number of trials trying to answer this question. So SAR, another study led by David Lando and Guys and Tommies, where well, those patients who present with a potentially curable tumor would have up to three oligometastases at presentation. The standard of care is chemotherapy, but the experimental arm is chemotherapy, followed by radical treatment of the primary plus stereotactic radiotherapy to metastasis. Core is in a patient who had radical treatment. It includes breast, lung, and prostate cancer. And the standard of care is chemotherapy or palliative radiotherapy versus stereotactic radiotherapy to the other metastasis. So again, we're trying to answer this question, particularly in the advent of better systemic therapies, is there a role for stereotactic radiotherapy and other metastasis? And we also have, for those patients not superfluous, an ongoing perspective audit or the Commission for Malvation Program. Again, trying to give us some high level evidence of whether stereotactic rate therapy has a role in organ metastasis. So, moving away from organ metastasis, where we might be able to cure patients with either surgery, ablation, or stereotactic rate therapy, could ray therapy have an advantage in terms of stage four disease that's not amenable to local therapy? Some problems with it. There we go. So you could do this either with stereotactic ray therapy, conventional ray therapy, but why might stereotactic ray therapy be better? So it's very accurately delivered, very small fields, so you get less collateral damage, so less chance of toxicity with systemic agents. You get fewer fractions, so it's more convenient for the patient, and you get more cell kill with a bigger dose. So more cell kill, more tumor antigens, potentially more benefit with systemic agents. So we have some trials looking at this. This is a trial from Fiona McDonald at the Marsden, looking at combining pembrolizumab, a drug that's now well recognized and approved for patients in the metastatic setting, for those patients who've got 50% positivity or in the first line, for more than 1% in the second line. But 
This is looking, can we combine that with radiotherapy? And by combining with radiotherapy, is it safe? Because if it's safe, does it enhance the effect of immunotherapy? Very similar study, maybe, there we go, in mesothelioma, again led by uh, Fiona McDonald and Stephen Harrow in Glasgow, seeing whether they'd have a role in mesothelioma. We're also looking at our look at progression. So some patients, particularly the small minority of patients who have a driver mutation, are often on these medications for a long time. And some of these patients will develop oligoprogression rather than more general progression. So the idea of the HALT study, which should be open, is open, just open now, is if they have oligoprogression, if we treat those metastasis with SABR, does that prolong the time they're on that first line TKI? Does it improve progression-free survival? Is it safe? So trying to answer whether there's more indications for stereotactic ray therapy in the metastatic setting. We're also looking at conventionally fractionated trials, and that's in locally advanced disease. Well, ADSCAM is a UK study looking at different fractionation schedules. So our standard is giving chemotherapy for those patients not suitable for chemo rad in the stage three setting. They're either given our standard ray therapy, which is 55 grain 20 fractions, compared to chart, which is giving ray therapy three times a day. Ideal and isotoxic, what's called an isotoxic, are all different ways of giving what's called isotoxic ray therapy. <coughs> so you don't give as much dose to the tumor, you base the dose on the organ at risk. So the dose of the organ at risk are low, you give a high dose to the tumor. So you give as much dose as you safely can to try and intensify the ray therapy. We're also looking at addition of novel agents. So in the palliative setting, the pair studies look at the combination of pembrolizumab with palliative <coughs> ray therapy. That's led by Marina Armin at the margin. But we're also looking at combining with systemic agents in radical ray therapy, where stereotactic ray therapy is not feasible due to the proximity of normal organs. So we have the Paris study that's now just about to open, which is led by Professor Farberfield in the Christie, where we're giving pembrolizumab before the treatment and going on through radical ray therapy with a phase of pembrolizumab afterwards. First of all, see if it's safe. And does that ray therapy enhance the immunotherapy? <coughs> or could it potentially make it worse by treating such a large field of <coughs> nodal disease, you actually reduce the immunotherapy. So we're trying to answer this question in a very controlled manner. We're also looking at Concord study. So this is a study where we're not only giving radical ray therapy, but combined with DNA damage repair. So DNA damage repair is a critical way that ray therapy works. So by giving it with a DNA damage repair agent, we're trying to see whether that improves things. So in conclusion, I've rapidly run through where we're at at the moment in the UK in terms of ray therapy for lung cancer. I think hopefully you agree with me that advanced technology have improved our ability to outline the tumour. We can give a better dose. We can reduce the dose of normal tissues. We can ensure our treatment is accurate. And that increases higher cure rates. But going forward, I think SABER may have a role in the treatment development of metastatic disease. I think the addition of novel agents have the potential to improve outcomes not just in early stage, local advance, but also the oligo progression. And I think very interesting, particularly the combination of immunotherapy and ray therapy in the advanced stage, we may be able to prolong some of the exception and benefits of immunotherapy in some patients, but also for those patients who's not suitable for immunotherapy, by giving ray therapy, you convert them into patients they might be. So a lot of things are happening. So I'm gonna wrap up there, got time for a few questions. And it's not just work done by us, a lot of people involved, so thank you to all of them. Thank you, Tom.